On today's Starting Nine, we talked to Hall of Fame catcher Mike Piazza about being the best offensive catcher of all time, playing for Tommy Lasorda, and owning Roger Clemens. Meanwhile, Carlos Correa is still looking for a job. Friend of the program, Eric Hosmer, just got one, and maybe it's time I bury my beef with Trevor Bauer. Let's have a nice show, boys. Action! And welcome back to Starting Nine. Carl here in Chicago, my co-host, partner in crime, Jake Arrieta in Texas. Happy New Year, buddy. Good to see you. Happy New Year to you as well and everybody listening to the show. Uh, I'm pretty excited right now for a lot of reasons, but we got the Horn Frogs in the national championship. A lot of my teammates, friends are are making their way out there to the game. I'm trying to figure it out. You know, we can't all sit together, but, you know, it's on Monday. The suites are just astronomically expensive. That's not going to happen. So um, we're going to make it work, though. I'll probably be out there. I don't know if Cooper's going to come with me. I might just fly solo. But got to be in attendance for that. And you are for sure, you're for sure going. It's about 95%. Yeah. Can I get a guarantee though? I want a hundred percent just so if you don't go, I want to talk some shit to you. I can't, I can't guarantee it yet, but 95% is pretty good. I just need to find myself a ticket, which won't be hard. We're going to, a lot of baseball stuff. We'll get to this. Michael Conforto's got a contract. We're going to get, I just, this is like the teaser thing. So people know we're going to talk about this stuff. Uh, we got the big, big news, obviously, with Correa. Uh, yeah, what's going on with this? Hosmer to the Cubs, Trevor Bauer stuff, Aaron Judge, Braves extend Sean Murphy. Um, I have a special request I want to make to you. We also have Mike Piazza, Hall of Fame catcher, coming on the show, like we said in the introduction. Yep, yep. Hall of Fame, arguably the best offensive catcher of all time. Yeah, I was just looking at his numbers, and it's um, – I don't even know if it's debatable – Maybe it is. Or maybe I'm just an idiot, but his numbers are silly. Silly good. That's why I was yeah, I didn't know if I said maybe arguable because um Yeah, maybe it isn't an argument at all because it's because it's Mike fucking Piazza. He like, absolutely raked, man. You know what I loved about his swing sometimes is that he his upper body was so strong. Like I saw some of the homers he hit off Clemens, like he didn't even need his legs. <laughs> it's like he got stuck. He got stuck with his with his front hip kind of blocked off he just said fuck it and just threw the hands and hit a 420 so yeah great great talk with 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 piazza uh he's an interesting guy and uh, i'm just envious of the hair still he's 55 years old and still looks great yeah you i was you wouldn't know that he was the best offensive catcher from the conversation very casual good guy we're going to talk to him like i said a little bit later i have so much news to get to i don't know if you want to talk your fr- we have a very good friend of yours i'm just going to put this right under i eric hosmer is coming to the cubs that's what it looks like i'm just i'm trying to keep tabs on it, it says the deal's close i haven't seen any terms yet have you i haven't seen anything but it's a good would- signing it's a good signing i mean we every most people know how hosmer is as a teammate in the clubhouse I mean, he had a 268 average last year between, you know, San Diego and Boston. I believe he had eight homers and 44 RBIs. Um, there's there's a lot of ability in there. Uh, so I like the signing uh, by the Cubs if it does indeed go through. And, you know, I think you're on board with that also. Yeah, leadership. Get that guy in the clubhouse. Yeah. Well, they don't have anybody at first base that's played more than, like, 100 games at first base in their life. Yeah, it gives them an opportunity to, you know, have a guy to, to – you know, put in lineup every day to play first base until, you know, fuck, what's his name? Until what's Mervis? his name's ready. Until Mervis may, may or may not be ready. We'll talk about this with Piazza about having, like, veterans around young guys that need to play. Could fuck with Mervis, though. Could fuck with Hosmer. You know, I hope, I just hope it's not one of those situations. He, he's He's been through some shit throughout his career. I don't think this will bother him. And he hasn't really done – I mean, he hasn't even played a – No, he hasn't played a shit. Who really cares. No one gives a shit. Like, he's got to earn it. And he will, hopefully. Where do you think Hosmer is going to live in Chicago? Well, he's got a young family now, so uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know the dog situation. I'd have to text him. I'm gonna. I would encourage Lakeview. Fuck, so I live in Lakeview. Smart View. choice. So you, you know. Yeah, find a nice, nice spot off of Southport, or you know, somewhere close, somewhere close to the yard. You're still within within reach of downtown and <clears throat> everything you else else you need in the city. I lived there for six years, five or six years. If you're a single guy and you don't have pets, go li- go live downtown. <clears throat> Do that whole deal. If you have kids, you have dogs, you don't be going up and down the elevator every fucking four hours to take the dog out. 
What else we got? I saw Dom Smith sign a one-year deal. Uh, what what happened to Dom Smith? I mean, was it just me or I mean, he? I thought he was raking everybody. Or was, I guess it was just me out there uh, a couple years ago. I thought he was on the rise. I, you might be late to this. I think he's been struggling a little bit. I I don't. No, I I know. I I know this wasn't just <laughs> overnight, but a couple years ago, I was like, damn, this guy's gonna be really good. All right, so I think baseball is the best sport when it comes to guys that are supposed to be good, and then you just hear the name and forever you're waiting for them to be good. Like the NFL, people are so quick to be like, that guy's a bust. And in the NBA, it's just like, I don't even know who any of these guys are. Because, just wait, uh, Zach Wilson. <laughs> Zach Wilson, <laughs> he's coming back. <laughs> baseball, though, do you remember the name Josh Fitters? I could. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, well, yeah. There's a ton of these examples. I'm just using him as one. Um, but just like prospects, I know anybody listening to this for your team, like top prospects, and then still, like, they'll be 27, 28 years old. Like, you'll see they sign a minor league deal with, you know, like the fucking Oklahoma Tulsa drillers or something, and you're like, you know what? He might still have it. He's fast. Yeah, and if, if you guys are listening, comment. Fuck, where, where should they comment? On your on the most disappointing prospect for your team. Because when you say, and this is nothing against Josh Vitters, or maybe it is, but he was a first-rounder what year? Like 2007. Seven, yeah. So he was six, my six year. or seven. My year. And I want to say that he was in AAA with the Cubs, like when I was traded over there, maybe. Uh, and I, he didn't give a fuck. He was over it. He was just ready to, he was ready to get the fuck out of the organization and just, I think, retire. They drafted, I want to say, if he wasn't, I believe he was 06, now I think about it, but. They drafted him above a bunch of people, but it was because he was supposed to be the best hitter in the draft and the best bat speed and the most natural and all this stuff. But I like your question about it's not maybe the biggest bust because I think that's me. I don't do that stuff. Like Brian Bullington got drafted first overall out of Ball State by the Pirates, I believe, in like 99 or 2000. No other – he should have gone like late first round, but they just knew they could sign him for like a million bucks or 900 grand, so they did it. Yeah. That's not necessarily a bust because he went first. He he's he should not have gone first, first overall. That's just the dynamics of the MLB draft back then. But I'm saying I like your question. Like, who's the biggest personal bust to like fans? Where it's like you really wanted to see this guy. Not necessarily. Oh, they were the top rated prospect, but somebody you latched onto and followed in the minor league system. Then they got there, and you're like, God damn it. There were some guys that I was fairly close to because just we played against each other. A guy like Joe Savory, um, first rounder with the Phillies, went to Rice, uh, kicked our ass, two way guy. Uh, Brad Lincoln, U of H, first rounder uh, by the Pirates, and I wanted to look him up because I think he, I think he got to the big leagues, but didn't stay for very long. Here's a name for I loved Matt Barry. Do you remember that name? Matt Berry from Rice, and then I think he played yeah. a cup of coffee. Uh, glasses, glasses, right? Uh, yeah, with the f- Orioles, maybe? Super funky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I can't call him a bust because he wasn't like a top draft pick. He was hurt. He threw like 150 innings his freshman year at Rice, and he got all banged up. But I just wanted to see I, – I loved guys like that. that I just want to see him. But then you get to the big leagues, and you just get – it doesn't matter how funky you are. Yeah, it's a little bit different. I mean, Brad Lincoln, he had bits and pieces of five years, I guess. But he was he was another one of those guys like Joe Savory. Like, okay, this guy, he's going to he's gonna play in the big leagues for 10-plus years. We're, we don't know if he's going to be a position player or a pitcher because they did both at a, at a super high level. But you know how hard it is to do, to do both. So, And they both kind of fizzled out, unfortunately. And it's funny, I get Mike Piazza to tell the draft bus story. Is he draft, well, not draft bus, but late round pick, huh? Yeah, it's insane to me that they were even having the discussion in the 62nd round, like, hey, should we should we draft this guy? I mean, it's the 62nd round. Who cares if if you draft him and he sucks? I, you know? So, I mean, it was, it was a different process at that time. But interesting that Tommy Lasorda was so active in that process. Yeah, I'm thinking back, listen to that, that Tommy Lasorda is basically in charge of, like Bill Belichick. Yeah. Now he loved Mike Piazza. The internet's ruined baseball because the draft being should still be 62 or 58 or whatever fucking rounds. It's just there's too much information now. You know who's good, you know who's bad. Back then, you had to draft everybody because you're like, hey, we're not really sure. We got to fucking get everybody together. Just the turnover, the injuries in this sport. Yeah, there's there's injuries in, in every other sport, but... 
you know, guys have arm injuries just time after time after time. And it's just like, you almost can't have enough pitching. So, I mean, if there's a guy, if there's a high school kid that throws 92 or, or better, like, yeah, just keep drafting those kids because half of them aren't going to be any good. There's going to be another percentage of them who, you know, have their character issue, like they have character issues. You just can't keep them in line. You know, once they get out of their parents' house, it's like, you know, they just go off the deep end sometimes. Um, and then there's a few that turn out to be good. So, so yeah, I, I completely get it why teams would just draft draft guys just, you know, until they <laughs> wouldn't let you draft anymore. Would you like to see that again? Yeah, I, I love that, dude. Because I like the favors, too. You know, you'd see like, oh, this guy got drafted? That was a great – that used to be a great footnote – for NBA, NFL, NCAA football. Like, oh, this guy was a 47th rounder. Like, oh, yeah. They used to say that shit about Mike Vick. Did Mike Vick get drafted in, like, the ninth round? I have no idea. We got some other big news for you. Huh? Yeah, I'm just looking through all this shit, too. Uh, you know, we haven't, haven't really covered much of this. Hate to see it. Giants des designated my guy, Time of the Stella, for assignment. Um, you know, fuck it. Keep your head up, Tommy. And Moose. It's all good. It's all good. Mike Moustakis, uh, institutional friend of starting nine, Mike Moustakis. We like yeah. Mike Moustakis a lot. All right, let's. I want to address Carlos Correa real quick. We have to talk about this. We are going to talk about Carlos Correa. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Broader, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed or like you're not showing up in the way that you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. Um, whether or not you guys have been in therapy personally, I, I can tell you guys, you know, the, the broader benefits are huge. It's very much worth your time, especially this time of year as you're resetting, recharging the batteries. Uh, take on that better version of yourself and go to BetterHelp for the assistance you need. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash starting today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash starting. Super easy. Check it out, guys. Um, Carlos Correa injury news. What the fuck, man? Yeah, well, it's going to be a different contract. We had a brief conversation about this, and it seems like that's um, really the only option at this point for Correa to agree to a contract. There's probably going to be an exclusion clause in this in the contract that will say something like if he spends uh, a number of days on the injured list um, with a certain injury or specific injuries uh then you can void future uh future parts of that contract uh or you can make it a lower guarantee and there's so many there's a lot of different ways to do this and if you remember um i was having this conversation with with john lackey a few days ago you know it was like if if he had any sort of arm injury during the course of that contract like he were, i think he made minimum like big league minimum and that, uh, that actually happened. So, uh, we'll see. I mean, it, 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 it looked like it was going to be a done deal, you know, but as soon as the San Francisco said no, and then the Mets, you know, said, fuck it, we'll agree, we'll agree to these terms. And then everything was kind of drawn out. It seemed like this was just, uh, an inevitability at that point. So we'll see when we get some more information on it. He was my number one shortstop at the start of those. And now this stuff comes out, and you start to – like, Dansby Swanson looks looks like a better deal now. You know, the Xander Bogarts – like, those deals look better in the wake of this because no matter how much talent or anything, if you're not on the field and there's injury concerns, um, value plummets drastically. Yeah, I just want to know if if his leg is the primary concern because I'm I'm – like we talked about, I'm just trying to go through and figure out – which issues that he's been on the IL for are the biggest concerns for the Mets? Well, you know, maybe like it's a, something he hasn't been hurt for before. Maybe they like maybe. noticed like bone decay or something in a fibula. Like this is going to break down long term. Well, and that was one of the things you spent time on the IL for was a, a fractured like lower leg. 
from a foul ball, I believe. Maybe, Colin. I believe so. I think that was it. So I just want to see him play though. I want to see well, him he's play. Gonna play. He's gonna play. He's gonna play. Okay. He just might might be signing for a lot less money. He's still gonna be still gonna sign for a bunch of money. Yeah, but look at Conforto last year. He didn't sign. But I know Tetska's teams necessarily weren't really to pay the price. No, uh, he's a different he, kind of player. He did just sign for the Giants two years, thirty six million. Him and uh him and Jack Peterson together in that lineup should be pretty cool, but go let's go back. Correa. I'm pulling for yeah, well just say, real quick, I'm pulling for Conforto. I really am. I mean I, he kinda got fucked. Or maybe he fucked himself. I don't know, but um, I'm glad that he's he's signed with the team because uh, I I think he's I think he's got a lot of ability and I hope it I hope it works out for him this year. And back to Correa, what do you got? All right, here's what I don't understand about the Correa stuff. Where it goes is Steve Cohen's ego is huge, obviously, rightfully so. Scott Boris ego is huge, obviously and rightfully so. They're going to come together. How much is this guy worth? It's known Steve wants him, and it's known Scott wants it. You know. Who's willing to take a step back at the negotiating? Because 13 years and 300 whatever million, someone's going to have to take a step back. And you know Scott's not going to fucking – Scott's like, okay, yeah, here's – how about how about 13 years? Scott will probably ask for more money after all this. Scott will be like, you know what, a lot of pain and suffering. This guy's going to have to battle through this more an extra million each year at 13 million of the whole thing. <laughs> If anybody could do it, it'd be him. Uh, you might see, you might see eight years with with the higher AV. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, it, I don't even know which direction they're gonna go go uh, in with this. As far as uh, you know, because if it's if it's that big of a concern, you you would think that they're not gonna not gonna give him a twelve year deal. Then, if it's that, if it's if it's that worrisome for them. Right, like you're not gonna go still yeah. go twelve years, or may, maybe you put clauses in there every every three, four, or five years. <clears throat> who who fucking knows, man? This is this gets pretty uh, pretty elaborate. Yeah, it's a good test of Steve Cohen's willingness to do whatever. I thought that Brandon Mo eight years one sixty two was was a huge like this guy does not give a shit. I shouldn't say it like that because Brandon Nemo is a fine ball player, but eight years this is so eight years is reserved for fucking like the A rods in my life. That's how I think about it. But no, what would be crazy is for Steve Cohen to come back and still just cut whatever check it takes to get Correa. If it's still a massive number, like there's just such a good fuck you factor for me is how much Steve Cohen adjusts and plays ball with Boris here because I think end of the day Scott Boris is going to be at least likely to back down in, in the battle between Steve Cohen and. Steve or Scott, I'm taking Scott 100 out of 100 times. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I don't in know this Steve Cohen very, really at all. I know he's very wealthy and he's had success. I know Scott very well. I know he has a way with words and a way with people. He's going to get this thing done. Um, I think the terms might be a little bit lower than they initially were, and that that's okay. But I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if... If it's pretty close, Scott's going to do, he's going to do his best, uh, best that he can for Correa, but he also understands that if it is legitimate injury concerns, if there's something there that we, we haven't seen yet or we haven't heard of, um, then, then he'll, he'll find a way around it. He'll have to, uh, they'll have to renegotiate, but that's all right. That's all right. I just fucking, I need to know what it is. I need to know what it is. Maybe that bone, maybe his lower leg, uh, maybe there's a weakness in there. I don't know. We need answers. Yeah, I have no speculation. I don't want to get sued. Yeah, I, I, like don't like to, I don't like. I don't like to do that either. That's why I say like I think his bulge is too big. That's what I said when it first came out. And then people were like, "Oh, dude, what are you?" It's just a joke. And now we're back to bulges. Uh, Kimbrel to the Phillies, ten million. Good for him. Good for I like him. the signing. I like the signing a lot. I mean, he hasn't been. The, the Craig Kimbrell that everybody knows, knows and loves, but see, he's still got it. Take a $10 million flyer and a Hall of Famer. See what, see what he can do for you. I just don't know if, if Kimbrell, that relationship between Phillies fans and Craig Kimbrell is going to be an interesting one. 
uh, he, he's cowboy. He's going to show up ready to work. And uh, w- when he went through, the, you know, those rough patches in Chicago, kind of it, it, it was tough on him. But uh, he bounced back, you know. He bounced back and threw the ball pretty well. Went to uh, went to the White Sox. Went out to L.A. I mean, overall, were, were his numbers in L.A. bad? Or did he yeah, just no, have – did I mean, he have a stretch where – yeah, he had a period of time where he was good, and then he had a period of time where he was really bad. No, he was in a good close. I shouldn't say it like that because he wasn't. He just wasn't an effective closer. So they took him out of the closing role. He can only close, though. He said this before. It's it's so well documented that he only wants to close. So uh, f- the Phillies, it's an interesting move because I think there might be right there might be an opportunity for him to be a guy who shuts the door there. Huh? Yeah. Well, with his pedigree and he's still throwing ninety-seven miles an hour, I would bring him in too. I just would. And I give the guy credit because, I mean, that's like the worst environment for a closer trying to get his shit back together would want to go is Philadelphia. Those people are fucking rude. That's why I bring up the – I mean, the fans will like him, love him, whatever. He's a nice guy. I'm just saying like – They don't give a fuck if you're a nice guy or not like uh, or a uh, future Hall of Famer. uh, They're going to let you hear it if you suck. But he he doesn't care. He doesn't care about that. Lenny Dykstra lead off tomorrow if it gave him a better chance of winning the division. Yeah. Uh, let's do a little catcher, and we'll get to Mike Piazza in a second. The Braves extend Sean Murphy uh, $73 million through the end of the 2028 season. So now they've got Austin Riley, Michael Harris, Matt Olson, Sean Murphy, Spencer Strata, Acuna, Vaughn Grissom, Ozzy Elbies, Kyle Wright, Max Freed, all under like long-term control. Yeah, we, uh, we had a conversation about that, and didn't it? It just made sense to sign Sean Murphy to an extension. I mean, you got all these young guys, and uh, he was under control, and you could get him for, I mean, yeah, it's $73 million over six years for, yeah, one of the best catchers in the game. You save, the, you know, I think everybody would agree, they save a pretty good amount of money by doing that contract now. And there's risk. Of course there's risk. But, I mean, look what he did last year. I have a take. I have a bad take. I have a take. Any take is a good take. Well, I know this is going to get clipped and gone on, or yeah, <laughs> sent around Instagram. So fuck it. And Braves fans are ruthless, but I'm going to say it anyways. I think the Braves are stupid for removing all of the incentive to perform well and play for a contract from that team. What if I just named 15 guys on this roster that are locked up for so long? These guys would be out playing golf, having lunch, you know, getting an extra slice of cheesecake before the game. No, I just, bro. No. Hey, not everybody's on the cover of ESPN body doing Pilates, driving themselves. A lot of people are sitting at home, you know, looking for an excuse to take the day off. Walmart can money, said. Yeah, can money make you comfortable? Sure, of course it can. But, like, Atlanta, I feel like they do such a good job of, of combining the right group of guys, right group of core guys that, that want to win. Like, they got a World Series a couple years ago. Like, I think that they're still hungry for that. Like, I don't think that the money's going to get in the way of their ultimate goals maybe for a guy or two it, it could sure like a little bit of laziness not as not as um you know not as likely to show up as early or, or do the early work or work out quite as hard do that extra sprint whatever maybe maybe that happens but um i think collectively they have enough guys there that won't allow that to happen so we'll see but you're not you're not 100% wrong. Maybe an extra slice of cheesecake and then over the course of 6 <laughs> years then then Sean Murphy's, you know, he's a little he's a little dumpy and and can't move behind the plate quite as well. I'm looking at his projections on on um baseball reference for next season. I don't, I don't really like him. I mean, the computer's smarter than I am, but they got him at 238 18 homers, uh, 62 RBIs. 484 plate appearances. I don't I think he's going to be higher than that. On a better team. On a better team. You know, he hit 250 with Oakland. He's going to have a lot more surrounding him. I think he's going to hit 275. You get good players together, everybody's going to play better. Absolutely. This is not a wide receiving court where, like, all right, you get one good receiver means the other receiver gets less targets. Everybody gets their chances. Everybody plays better. More pressure. When you're on the mound and there's no breaks in lineup, you're like, all right, I gotta face, uh, I gotta face Acuna. 
I got to face Murphy. Um, I got Riley. You know, I got to face Olsen. Uh, it's just, there's no breaks, you know, and it, especially young pitchers, it puts a lot more pressure on them to make, to make pitch after pitch after pitch. And then next thing you know, they're missing up over the plate. They're trying to overthrow. They can't spin their breaking ball for strikes. That's what good teams do. Good teams put that constant pressure on the opposing pitching. Um, and they just, you know, they, they, they don't let up. They're, they're relentless. And Atlanta, Atlanta is going to be a team like that. I mean, the NL, NL Central, man, it's going to be a fucking nice division this year. East. Oh, East, Jesus Christ. Atlanta, East. No, East. You know, I get my directions mi- mixed up. But, yeah, I mean, is, do you think you think there's a better division? No. The East no, because strong. the Marlins have filthy pitching. And then yeah. the Nationals will have young guys come up a little bit. Not not now, not now, but, but while the other teams are very good, the Nationals will be making their climb back. Um the Marlins is, has always been a team. Like, if you take them lightly, they'll, they'll take two out of three. And you get out of town, and you're like, how did we just lose two out of three? Well, you know, they, they have two or three guys that can, really, that can really throw it. And every now and again, they'll put up some runs, if, if you take them lightly. But, you know, a team like the Phillies, you know, or the Braves, uh, like when I, was, when I was in Philly, you know, we didn't, we didn't really have that that ability to go on there and just put our foot down and, and sweep them. But that's what the Braves did, and that's why they were winning the division every fucking year. Yeah, the Braves talk about Sean Murphy has me, like, the juices flowing about the catcher position and the conversation we're having with Hall of Famer Mike Piazza a little bit. But while we're going out to Los Angeles, let's stay in Los Angeles. Trevor Bauer news. Uh, Trevor Bauer reinstated. He's going to have a 50-game suspension at the start of 2023. And the Dodgers have to make a decision very soon in the next 48 hours. While this podcast is really – 24 hours from the day of the release of this podcast to make a decision if they want to bring him in for 2023 and be sp- suspended for the first 50 games. And I want to say they owe him like 32, 35 million or something. I think or, I did see that too. Yeah. yeah. Where I think they get rid of him and he can sign elsewhere, but he's still suspended first 50 games this season. What do you think they do? I mean, what's the feeling like around, around baseball and, and baseball fans? How do, how do you know, guys that are listening, how do you feel about Trevor Bauer now? You know, I, I still don't even know all the fucking details. I guess some of it was bad. We don't know. We wanted to have Bauer on. I think we should still try and get him on the show just to talk to him. He thinks we're going to bury him <clears throat> and air him out. I don't think that's the case at all. We just want to hear what's going on. Um, we know he's been throwing. I mean, we're always – I see videos of him all the time, you know, throwing bullpens and, and facing hitters. He's going to be ready. I mean, if you were a team um, – and we've seen this in the past. Professional sports teams are willing to put things behind them to bring in a player that's extremely talented. So uh, he's reinstated. He has to serve 50 games. But what are your thoughts? Would you bring him in? Am I trying to win a championship? And is that window closing? Yeah, then I bring him in. I agree. Do I have a young core of guys that can't respond to that type of stuff and are going to be weird and affected by it? I don't bring him in. Well, look, I mean – I wouldn't bring him in if it's going to be if, – if there's pussies in the clubhouse, they're going to be like, well, I don't want this guy in here. I'd bring him in if there's dogs in the clubhouse that are like, yeah, I don't give a fuck, whatever. We need this guy to go out and pitch. Like you said it, man. If he's going to help us win, bring him in. If he wants to you – know, he's going to be on social media. He's going to fly his drone around. Who gives a fuck, man? If he can, if he can go out there and pitch, and we know, we know he can do that. We know he can do that. So I'm not um, judging him. No, I love the ability. You know, what happened, happened. Not saying it's not okay, but I don't even know the details, so I'm not going to even get into that. But what I am going to get into is, is Trevor Bauer's ability. Um, <clears throat> and like you said, maybe you get, him, you get him at a discount. The Dodgers, if they decide to release him, uh, and I think you said they were supposed to <clears throat> be on the hook for $32 million. If they let him go, maybe you can bring him in for, for 20 I don't know. Seems like a bargain for a guy like Trevor Bauer. You want to talk about tunneling and how, and pitch selection? Like, that guy can do that. You know, he's still up to 97, maybe more. So you got to think about it. A little chip on the shoulder? Uh, absolutely. He's been throwing fucking sim games and, and facing, you know, the king of Juco. I mean, we love the king of Juco, but the guy can't hit a fa- – he can't hit. Uh, he can hit a fastball. 
they can't hit spin. So he needs he needs some different competition. He needs some major league hitters to face. There's gonna be um, there's gonna be an adjustment period for him. But dude, the guy the guy's ready to go. His hair he's got long hair. Like he uh, he still looks mobile. He's throwing hard. He wants to play baseball. He wants to play in the big leagues for for a winning team. Um, <clears throat> you know, let's let's try and get him on the show. I know you reached out to him before. He doesn't like you very much, but maybe he's changed his mind. Well, I was pretty judgmental. I've changed my ways. <laughs> yeah, of course. We all do. No, I'm 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 more open minded. I'm trying to think of how Tommy Lasorda would handle a situation if he were still running the Dodgers. We're gonna get into that. Let's talk to Mike Piazza. The culture around the Dodgers as he talks about as a young guy coming up and the level of influence you can kind of pull from like, you know, Tommy and um some of those stories and shit like the social stuff. It's a very interesting conversation. Yeah, I saw I saw just quickly about Lasorda that he would walk around the clubhouse kind of in his in his long underwear, just like with his bag hanging and his high socks and talking to parents and talking to players. Like, yeah, just just doing his thing. Let's get into Mike. But real quick, a word from one of our sponsors, HelloFresh. You've got New Year's goals, and HelloFresh is here to help you achieve them. Skip the grocery store and take control of your time and budget with delicious recipes delivered right to your door. Don't you love it, Jake? I do. I can't wait to put another order in. I mean, it makes things easy around the house. The kids actually show some interest in cooking. We don't get the spices and all that kind of shit mixed up. It tastes great every time. With HelloFresh, eating well in the new year can be stress-free and delicious. With over 35 weekly recipes, they have the options you're looking for to help you achieve your goals. Uh, skip the snowy schlep to the grocery store and stock up on snacks, sides, desserts, and more at HelloFresh Market. That was a sentence. Skip this. Skip the snowy schlep to the grocery store. S simply add these staples and sweets to your weekly order, and they'll arrive at your doorstep along with meals. We love HelloFresh. Official meal delivery show is starting nine. Um, we love them very much. Go to HelloFresh.com slash starting21 and use code starting21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. 21 free meals. Uh, that's code starting21 at HelloFresh.com slash starting21. Let's get to Mike Piazza. All right, we're now joined by Hall of Fame catcher Mike Piazza. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year you do too, man. Um, I, I right out of the gate, I got to ask you because I saw I saw a lot of ads for the show um, recently. Um, you were on a show called Special Forces on Fox, um, and when I saw that trailer, uh, I got excited right away. I really love like military and that sort of training. Um, and I saw a quote that you said, you know, you might have become a little soft. And you wanted to know if you still had that fire. So did you find that you still had it? Well, it was. Uh... Did I find it? Yeah, but it's kind of like an old car when you hit the accelerator and you realize you don't have a lot left in the tank. And uh, it was painful in a lot of ways. Uh, but I will say the positive experience was that, yes, I mean, I was definitely very intense about trying to complete the course and, and do the drills and be a good teammate and um, connected with an incredible cast. Uh, I really was impressed with everyone on the show. Uh, we really bonded. We have a group chat now. I mean, I just talked to Dwight Howard. He texts me from Taiwan and he's like, miss you, bro. Miss you, bro, too. So we, we when you're thrown together with a bunch of people of like-minded um backgrounds and, and experiences uh we came together very quickly and i think that was the most rewarding thing but personally it was frustrating i i will say i think the biggest thing i learned was that it's a young man's occupation because when you're no trying doubt. to do things that for guys designed 18 to 25 and you're 54 um yeah it was it was hard <laughs> body still holding up though yeah i mean i kind of it's funny i was working out yesterday and i was gonna post some but yeah i'm really lazy with stuff so i was like oh, whatever but <laughs> i banged up my shoulder really a lot on the show and my elbow and i couldn't really do heavy dumbbell presses and so it took me until yesterday to finally get back to the level I was before the show because I guess it was tendonitis and just soreness. And because that one drill, you always see me going down, uh, and I don't want to spoil it, of course. You got to watch it from the start. But um, 
that banged me up pretty good. I, I was in bed pretty much for about three days when I got back from the show. I was banged up really good. Oh, man. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I looked up. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want you to give a lot away, but is there one thing that you could maybe tell us that was the most difficult or something maybe water related that you were nervous or scared to do? Yeah, um, that one particular drill uh, with what Navy SEALs actually do, where they actually get submerged in, in an automobile. And um, for me, that was terrifying because. It's one thing to go swimming and it's another thing to go swimming in the ocean and, and you feel like in control and, and you can obviously, if you're close, if you get tired, but this is a whole different experience. And it may look that that's the thing. It may look sort of like, Oh, what's the big deal. But man, when you're in that car and that water's coming up and you realize that you got a seatbelt on and you go down 20 feet deep and it's salt water and you got to open your eyes and automatically panic. It's so hard to not panic. Um, and you know, they, they told me something very interesting. They said that many people drown, uh, when they unfortunately drive off into like eight to 10 feet of water, they just panic. And it's a whole day you get claustrophobic and it's, it's something you have to obviously try to stay calm and control the environment. And it, especially, and he said, look, I'm not going to scare you, but I mean, we've seen stories of people, you know, mom with two kids in the back driving into the water, run off the road, whatever, late night, uh, snow, whatever the case may be. And they drown because it's just, they don't have the presence of mind to calm down, control the environment, able to leave the pressure, open the door and get out of the car. And so when you're doing it in a car that's underwater, it's, it's a whole, <laughs> it's a whole different thing. And yeah, it really is. Are those the tips? Were those the five things they say, or what would, would, would ha if I drive my car in the water tonight, what would, would I do? Yeah, that? uh, absolutely. Um, if you have oxygen, uh, take in as much oxygen as you can. Don't try to open the door because the, the pressure is too much. We had to go out the back of the car that was by design, but, um, and then, you eventually got to open the window and let the water in and try to get out, make sure your seatbelts on, you know, it's just basically having presence of mind. And they said, if you get confused, uh, follow the bubbles. So, you know, the bubbles obviously go up. So if it's dark and you get disoriented blow, you know, blow bubble and that's up. So that's obviously it's easier said than done, but yeah. Um, it's just something will help your, your potential for survival. Absolutely. I, I like the concept of talking about very challenging things with you, Mike, because in the game of baseball, I think you're responsible for one of the most challenging stories of all time. 62nd round of the hall of fame. I've heard it like a thousand different ways from 10,000 different people or whatever the saying is, but I, I need to hear it from you. Uh, 62nd round, 1988, I believe out of, out of a Miami Dade community college of, uh, Pennsylvania boy. Can we get the origin story from the horse's mouth here? Well, not to sort of downplay my own legend, but um, basically I was a pretty decent player coming out of high school. Uh, I was all two-time All-State uh, out of Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Famous other alum is uh, Neil Olkowitz from the Hogs and uh, Andre Thornton, who was a great hitter for, the, for Cleveland in the 80s. Uh, we went to Phoenixville High School and I was all state, had two very good years. I came down to UM on a scholarship and was basically overmatched. Didn't really have a true position. I was playing first base at the time and they had just come off a national championship. And uh, it was just one of those things. I went to a place where uh, I, was, I was at the wrong place at the wrong time, just couldn't really fit in. And I realized that if I needed, I needed my career at that time to, to get at bats and get experience. So I transferred to Miami Dade Junior College and played for a great coach. Uh, he had confidence in me, uh, and I was still playing first base. But during the May, the season, I uh, broke a, a tore ligament in my left hand playing first base. I tried to tag a guy at first when he was running, and it split my knuckles apart. And I was out of uh, on the DL basically for the main scouting weeks of the season. So a lot of scouts didn't really get to see me play. They didn't know what position. I mean, I was playing first, but they didn't know if that was my true position. And then Tommy and my father and Joe Ferguson came up with the idea of potentially putting me behind the plate to catch. And then later on in the summer, the, the draft happened and Tommy called the Dodgers and said, look, let's draft them, give them a shot. Maybe we'll see if we can convert them to catcher. And that's what they did. And then at the end of the summer, I went out to LA. They wanted to take one last look at me and, uh, 
the head of the scouting, uh, uh, the head scout for the Dodgers saw me hit and he's like, at the end of the day, we got to sign this guy because he could really swing the bat. So I went to junior uh, to instructional league, started working with Johnny Roseboro and Kevin Kennedy behind the plate every day and eventually got comfortable behind the plate and uh, still continue to maintain my hitting and improve my hitting uh, and just climb the ladder slowly but surely. So there was a little bit of hesitation to even as, as the type of play you were to choose you in the 62nd round or was there was there any talks of them or somebody else taking you before that? And you know, we know with with technology now people get if there if there's good players out there they get seen. But back then it wasn't quite the same. So it does make sense that certain scouts maybe didn't get their rounds to see you play. Uh but it's kind of crazy to me that you know, they were debating to draft you or not even, even that late in the draft. Correct. Well, as you, as you mentioned, there, there was no internet, there was no, uh, <clears throat> you know, cell phones, uh, there were cell phones, but they were by the very, very elite, uh, very, very few and far between. And yeah, the old school scouting was just getting in the car, watching a guy, writing reports, sending them in, um, by mail and things like that. So yeah, it was a different, uh, atmosphere or at least a different landscape for scouting, but, the one thing I will say is, um, I mean, if you look at my scouting reports from high school and from junior college, I mean, there was some positives there. I mean, the scouts knew that I could swing the bat. And I think the only question was, they're not, uh, scouts are to look at pure talent. They're not into, well, where's this guy going to play or whatever. So they figured, okay, well, what do we draft him as? Is he a first baseman? And at the time I wasn't catching. So to be a slow footed first baseman at that time. And, and even though I was young still for my power continued, took years to continue to refine that as well. So um, that was pretty much it. I mean, you know, you look at some other great players like Don Mattingly and John Smoltz. I mean, they, they weren't high draft picks at all. I think I've seen occasionally they have, you know, the all-star team for the lowest round picks and some of the names are pretty interesting. So um it's just, you know, at that time, too, teams had a lot more players. I mean, now the draft is limited. Um, the minor leagues just contracted a few years ago, so they eliminated a bunch of teams. Um, there were more independent teams. So the whole theory back then was more is more, and now less is more. And uh, teams now are saying, well, why are we going to pay and draft and um, sign these guys and, and develop them if they're never going to make the big leagues? So now they're doing it in the old, this new way, whereas in the old way, it was just, we want more guys. And if we get a diamond in a rough, that's what we want. So that's kind of like a, a, was a positive for me. They're like, we have our prospects, but we need guys to play with the prospects. So that was a different philosophy. Now, now they're more into refinement and specialization and more boutique type of um, player development uh, philosophy. I think it's great to hear like the Tommy Lasorda connection is close. You're, you're just casually saying like, yeah, Tommy and my dad, and I've, you know, heard it before. So he was always close with you coming up in the minors or yeah, before then at the risk of sounding long winded. I mean, I, I don't want to jam in a whole bunch of stuff, but uh, my Tommy is from Norristown. My dad's from Norristown. I was born in Norristown. And then he moved out to Chester County when I was a baby and um, they were just very close. Uh, my dad went into the army. Tommy went into baseball and every time they would come back to break, they would reconnect. And then Tommy eventually started working his way up to eventually be the third base coach for the great Dodger teams of the 70s. I mean, they went to the World Series, I think, in 73, if I'm not, in 74, I believe. They played the A's and lost. And Bill Buckner was on that team, as a matter of fact. Um, but I remember as a kid going down to Vet Stadium in Philly, and Tommy would come over to the rail and talk to my dad. And I remember being so impressed and enamored that my dad knew somebody you know on the team and uh, as I started coming into high school Tommy would make me the bat boy he would send me equipment uh he would let me take batting practice on the field in the cage and and one time I think I was about 14 years old and Mark Cressy was pitching to me and I was just crushing the ball in the cage and Tommy was walking down the tunnel. He didn't see he was hitting. He said in his colorful language you know who the f is that hitting because all the guys were in the clubhouse and uh, my dad goes, that's Michael hitting, you know, uh, Mark's working out with him. And he came over and he was astounded. He said, let me tell you something. He goes, this kid really can swing the bat. He's got some potential. And I was actually pitching at the time too, because 
you know, I had a decent arm and there was a time where they didn't know whether to try to make me a pitcher or a hitter. So, uh, you know, back in those days, we did, we did play many positions, uh, uh, third base, outfield, pitching, hitting, but, um, yeah, from there, he always tried to sort of be a guiding light and help me in my career. And honestly, at times, it wasn't always a positive because once I got into the minor leagues with the Dodgers, there's always political strife and, you know, there's players that and, and coaches that con, con, have conflict with Tommy because they'll send Tommy a player and he won't like the kid and it'll turn into politics and, and, and petty infighting. So I was a little bit of a subject of that at times. And it, it sometimes worked to a disadvantage. But at the end of the day, it made me persevere and it gave me a lot of armor and it allowed me to mature and tune out a lot of those political issues and just play baseball. So that was something for me that I think really helped as well with my development. Was there was there ever a time where some of your peers might have felt like there was some favoritism towards you from Tommy or was he like that with a lot of people or was that just like because you guys had that connection? Yeah, there was. Of course there was. But I got to tell you, the ultimate litmus test is playing. So when I got out on the field and I started to hit it, it, it even the most even the most hard, hard, you know, critic against me or say, oh, he's only here because of Tommy. You know, they're seeing me hit and they're seeing me play. They're like, okay, I get it. I mean, yeah, check the numbers. Good. Yeah. And that's really what it comes down to. I mean, there was a time where I really wasn't playing well. And, and there was a, I wrote it, but wrote about it in my book where I actually, I walked away from the game uh, because I was having a conflict with the coach. And um, I talked to Lee Ilya because I actually, who was coaching the Phillies at the time, they were in Clearwater. And I said, you know, I may not make, I may get released. I may, um, the Dodgers may not, I said, do you have room in the Phillies? And at the time he said they may or may not, but he told me one thing I'll never forget. He said, Mike, he goes, baseball is like college. He goes, if you have the grades, you're going to graduate. He goes, if you're a good player, they're going to play you. They don't, you know, you hear players all the time. Well, I would have been great if I had got injured or the coach didn't like me. I'm sorry if I'm a coach now I'm coaching Italy and it's like, I may not like a kid, but I may hold my nose and write him in the lineup. If I feel like, He's going to help me. You know, there's no such thing. If a coach is going to not play a guy because he doesn't like him or they clash personality wise, then he's a horrible manager. So as much as the Dodgers, I think at times did not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We're a little bit, um, uh, I guess uh, it was, it was difficult for them. The relationship I had with Tommy, because Tommy was always saying, you got to play this kid. You got to play this kid. And the minor league managers are like, well, we're also trying to help other guys. Um, it was a little bit of a conflict thing, but at the end of the day, um, it really, Tommy definitely was my guardian angel and, and helped me. And then even when I got to the big leagues, I mean, they made a decision to let Mike Sosha go because in 93, when I came up with a veteran staff, I mean, you had Oral Hershiser, um, Kevin Gross, Jim Gott, Tom Candiotti, Roger McDowell, all these veterans. And if they knew Mike Sosha was on the bench behind me and I wasn't playing well, they'd be like, you got to put Sosha in. This kid can't catch. He can't play. So Tommy said, no, we can't sign Mike Sosha back because if we do, it it will not be good for Mike. And so that was another thing that he went to bat for me on, uh, you know, which I'm always very grateful for. Crazy. What Now, Tommy Lasorda, Bobby Valentine, you get to the Mets. How different was Bobby from what we're talking about with Tommy? I mean, Bobby was a character. I, I think the one thing Bobby, he always gets remembered for, obviously, putting on the, the mustache and, and his eccentric, his eccentric uh, behavior. Um, and I do miss the days that managers had these big personalities, you know, Tommy Lasorda, Whitey Herzog, um, you know, the, the, the white rat. You know, they, they, they had like these sort of um, Sven Gali type of guys, you know, these baseball geniuses who were in the dugout, uh, Bobby Cox, obviously being one of them. Uh, and um, now it's a little different, but uh, you know, Bobby was a smart guy. I'll give him all the credit in the world. I think obviously he had some issues, you know, that were, that were brought some conflict to the team uh, because I will say this, I mean, it is difficult being in New York playing, uh, or managing in New York, a lot of media. And then back then, as I said, there was no Twitter, there's no Facebook, there's no, it's all the scribes. It was about the papers and it was about the fan and it was about all this sort of energy that they would build up around the team. And it was a pressure cooker. And so this brought out 
different behaviors in people. I mean, I got more quiet and more focused. Some guys got a little bit more nervous and outgoing. And Bobby was one of those guys, you know, he just sort of liked to clown around and, and have the big smile and be on the top step. And, but I will say there, there was not really a lot of smarter men that I do recall in baseball as far as pl- player evaluation, game management. I just think Bobby had a few issues that worked against sort of building, you know, team unity at times because he just had a little bit of, of this sort of, um, I don't know, maybe someone was always looking over his shoulder and it, it just brought in some weird energy at times. But I will say as a player, and I tell this to kids, you may or may not like the person you're playing for, but you got to deal with them. Like you got to go out and play and do what you're asked to do. And I think guys get into trouble when they go, oh, you know what? He left me in to pitch to this guy and this guy's hitting 400 against me. You know what? Dave Weathers, a guy I played with who was a reliever and I'll never forget. He's like, look, I used to do that bullshit. And then I realized if they're going to put me up against King Kong, I'm going to try to make the pitches to get him out. I don't worry about, oh, they'll leave me in the pace. You know, he... His was Vlad Guerrero, you know, Vlad Guerrero used to kill him. But he said, hey, if I'm going to go up there and face the guy, I'm going to try and get him out. I'm not going to complain about the manager, the pitching coach put me in that position. So I tell kids all the time, try to block out that crap and just go out and execute. Yeah, and it's it's nice if your if your manager trusts you on the mound with a guy like that at the plate. Um I have been in those situations too. It's like fuck this this guy this guy hits me well, but I still got to face him 16 17 times a year, you know. Um well Carl Carl and I were going to, you know, we had a couple things where we want to do like a Tommy and Bobby segment and curious who had the shorter fuse and who would who would uh blow up a little bit more in the clubhouse kind of behind the scenes. Good question. Uh Tommy would blow up more. And I, and I remember, but, but it wasn't as venomous, if you know what I'm saying. Like it, it would, it had a certain amount of like showmanship to it. And he had some amazing speeches. I mean, again, this is a bygone era, you know, you just don't hear about this today, but Tommy would have these expressions. Like I was telling someone the other day, like, he'd be like, get your rest. You can't hoot with the owls and then soar with the eagles, you know? (laughs) And he would, and other things that I can't say, obviously, that are very, very salty. But um, he, and, and then Bobby Valentine had one of these uh, really amazing uh, speeches. I think we were playing St. Louis and they beat us and they hit a couple of our guys and they slid hard. And he gave this speech that I was just like, he goes, let's put their guy in the bullpen. And let's, and I just remember saying, this was freaking incredible. We went out and kicked their ass that night because we were so fired up. So over the course of a 162-game season, a, 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 a manager like that has to have a lot of material. So they can't throw it all out, you know, for the first losing streak. You know, they have to bring it out slowly. And Tommy was the master of that. He would always say – and he would, he would also ask us. He would say, Mike, do you think we need a meeting? And I'd be like, yeah, I think we do. Or he goes, you think we need a meeting? And me and Carol be like, nah, I don't think so, Tommy, not right now. Because if you do it too often, it loses its effect. You have to know when to air the guys out. You got to know when to, to pat them on the back and say, come on, hang in there. And over the course of a season, man, it's so long. It's such a marathon that a good manager has to know when to, to use the right nuances, you know, and the right sort of um approach to get the most out of his team and it's not easy i don't i don't envy that job it's very difficult there is an art to that because like you said if you're in there after every loss trying to trying to give a speech to the team it doesn't doesn't play well uh but like you said when bobby came in and he said what he said you all went out there and kicked the team's ass so it's it's really important to be able to do that and you're you said you're managing team italy is that correct yeah so now have you have you had conversations with with other managers or current managers uh, about how to approach things like that? Well, the good thing is that I have an incredible staff. So Blake Butera is more or less I call him my co-manager. I mean, he can't really be a co-manager. He's two time minor league manager of the year for uh, Tampa for the Rays. Uh, Chris Denorfia, who played uh, with me, played for us in, in Italy. He's double A manager for the uh, Rockies. I believe Jack Santora. So um, I think you segued into a good point. I mean, a manager is only is only as good as his staff. 
uh, you can't delegate. You can't control every aspect of the team. You, I tell the pitching coach, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna say to our pitching coach, hey, you know, you you set the rotations. Just give me your contingency plan. If a guy gets in trouble, who's your swing guy? That's pretty much what I do. I don't like to micromanage people, and I know you have to allow people to do their jobs. And I and I think in some cases maybe managers hurt themselves by when you feel a little bit out of control and you feel a little insecure and you feel like, you know, that they, they start to really micromanage every aspect of the team. And that destroys a little bit of that sort of Zen, I guess, lack of a better word, you know, where just guys are motivated and you have to keep people motivated and it's, it's, it's a difficult job. So getting to your point, um, I've been out of the game for a long time. I mean, there's a lot of trends and a lot of statistics and a lot of approaches that I have no idea about. So I go to Blake. I'm going to Blake. You, this is what your your territory is. You're you're in the game. You're in the machine. You know the trends. I'll kind of do the Newt Rockney speeches and get guys fired up and just kind of be an overseer. But but getting to your point, I mean, I couldn't do this if I didn't have an incredible staff. So we put together great staff, and it's still going to be a learning process. I mean, we think we have a good team, but baseball is luck too. You know, you can go out and play a perfect game, and they get one lucky hit and. The ball, you know, you're hitting rockets right at you. That's part of baseball. And in a short turn- tournament like this, it's it's very unpredictable. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm a little nervous, a little excited, but it's good. To, it's going to be good to be back on the field. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure, man. Is it a is it a one time thing managing, or if this goes well? <clears throat> well, again, it's a tournament. So you're talking about a three week commitment <laughs> compared. To- I'm talking yeah. about I'm talking about Mike Piazza getting back in a dugout well, a couple of years down the road, or someone says, hey. <clears throat> I, I honestly don't think so right now, only because just my life is at a different uh, stage. You know, I got a nine-year-old kid. I just love being around him. You know, we're living in Italy. He's he's actually not playing ball. I mean, he tried to play a little bit, but he's playing soccer now. So he kind of went into the soccer culture there. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I never say never. I mean, look, thing, life is different. And I do believe uh, – Sometimes getting out of your comfort zone, uh, you know, we have a car, I have a big business in, in Philadelphia. We're in the car business. We do real estate there. And so between family and Italy and, and the businesses here, it's, it's a lot of bandwidth. So, uh, but you never know. Kids get older, you know, kids go off to college. And if I'm still have my toe in the game and there's an interest there and um, there's a relationship there, I'll just, you know, play, just take it, take it in as it comes. In Italy, I know naps are huge. Uh, so I got to know, do, do you and your family partake in like the daily nap time? Naps? I'm a napper. But yeah. uh, I no, I don't know about everybody. I mean, that's, what uh, I, that's, what I, that's what I heard. I heard it's like after lunch, oh, everyone yeah, kind of yeah, shuts it's, down it's like, and has a nap. Like Spain. Yeah, it's like Spain, the oh, siesta okay. time where they close noon. And yes, they, they do open back up at 430. I don't know if that's necessarily a nap. I think it's weird. I mean, people do what we do. They go to the gym, they pick their kids up from school. It's just more or less like a cultural thing. Whereas um, it's funny because I remember one time uh, it was about a year ago and we were going to buy this small car because it's a long story. It was just not worth to lease or rent and go through all this paperwork. So I was like, let me just cash this car. But I walked in to buy this car at the dealership and the guy's like, whoa, we're on a break. <laughs> That was like if, <laughs> I a couple hours. My dad, can you imagine someone in our store, like if someone goes in to buy a car, they're like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, we're on break now." And I was like, "Oh my god, dude, it's it's, it's incredible the cultural differences." That's wild. But yeah, it, it, that's just yeah, it comes from Spain, and then s- people in Spain too, they eat real late. I mean, Italians eat late. I mean, being American and going to eat at six thirty, they look at you like you're from another planet. I mean, they eat they. Eat eight nine sometimes later in spain they eat like 10 or 11 so it's it's a different um different cultural dynamic and you so learn not it not as not as early arisers there because they kind of you know they sleep in or they going to bed late waking up early well again i'm maybe sort of generalizing a little bit only because that's maybe kind of the summer crowd for because that. europeans they love their vacation man you go to the august they call it the bridge the ponte which means from the last holiday in August, which is like the 15th till September 1st, nobody works. Just the restaurants and the hotels because everyone goes to the beach. And, man, they bake in the sun. It's like you'll see some people that you're like, man, I, I thought skin cancer was like a thing, but they apparently <laughs> don't care. So, 
it's yeah. really interesting to watch, you know, it's, and it's been a very, an, an incredible experience for my, myself and my kids as well. I got something on the list. I meant to ask you, I forgot when Bobby came up. Um, what did he tell you? What was the conversation with Bobby? Like after the Clemens world series incident? Where oh, that's interesting. Roger threw the bat. You know, that was, that was tough because, um, it was so bizarre. I think it was such a, a moment that none of us really um, experienced before. I mean, probably never experienced again. And what are the chances of the bat going right to him and him throwing it and, and saying it was the ball and whatnot. Uh, but as far as that particular game, you know, I do recall I hit a home run off, and I talk about this all the time, where I hit a home run off Jeff Nelson, which to me was probably one of my greatest home runs because that guy was so filthy. And there was only one particular pitch I could hit, and I just basically was looking for an inside fastball, and I got it, and, I, and it hit off the, the the foul pole. And we actually started coming back in that game. So a lot of the dynamics were like, should I have charged him? Should he have been thrown out? Should I have been thrown? I mean, and and I think at the end of the day, the real shame of that incident is that kind of masked a pretty good ball game. And unfortunately, in this era, in this world, that that will be the one thing that people remember about that series. But uh, the series itself was frustrating for us because we had momentum going to that series. And I truly felt we could have won it um, if we would have won the first game. And then obviously he pitched the second game. I mean, Todd Zeal missed a home run like by that. You know, Timo Perez got thrown out at home. Derek Jeter made another one of his head up, heads up uh, plays, a great relay to get Timo Perez at home. Timo thought it was a home run. So um, baseball's funny, man. You know, it's just I believe in momentum. I know the sabermetrics people go, There's, it's no such a thing, and it's hard to sort of compute or, or, or figure out. But ultimately, um, that was the most frustrating for me because I felt like, all in all, and then even put that incident aside, I just felt like we were the better team and we were playing better going into that series. But, you know, you just thank God you were there and you were given the opportunity and just, you know, turn turn the page in life. It's frustrating, but it's part of life. Well, and Mike, you had hit quite a few big homers off Clemens. And were they were the majority of them before that incident or were some of them after? Because I you you got them for you got them for some pretty big homers. Yeah. No, I, I think I had one more after him. I think it was 2003, if mm. I'm not mistaken. He was just uh, pissed. <laughs> he was pissed yeah. about that. Well, you know, Trot Nixon always made – I never forget a quote he said. He said um, – because they a bunch of the old-time guys were like, he should have expected he was going to drop him because he was hitting. So I think I was 8 for 12 off him with like, you know, three home runs and um, before uh, the World Series. And – you know, a couple old guys were, were in the old school were saying, ah, he should have been, you know, loose in his boots. You know, you know he was going to get dropped. And then Trot Nixon, which I'll never forget, he said a quote. He goes, well, if he was 0 for 12 off him, could he then throw his bat at him? You know what I mean? As a hitter, it's, it's the same thing I was talking about. Okay, I have no problem with guys pitching inside, but there's a difference between guys pitching inside and someone who's going to try and take your head clean off. So um, that's just – it is what it is. I mean, I've talked about it ad nauseum. And, uh, but – as far as hitting off them, I mean, it was just one of those things. I, I, I was able to recognize the pitches early. I was able to lay off his junk. I was able to just get him up. Um, and, I, and I hit a couple of breaking balls. His breaking ball was kind of slurvy. Um, and I just I saw the ball great against him. It's just one of those things. And then there's a guy like Scott Sanderson who I couldn't touch or um, El Duque, you know, I had trouble with. So there's just pitchers that you really see the ball and you're comfortable against. And there's guys that you really have trouble with. That's just part of the game. Yeah. I have to say, I have a thousand questions. This is what happens when you put me in front of a hall of fame <laughs> catcher. I, I can go all day, all night. I don't want to. Um, I just want to say, thanks for, thanks for joining the show. I do have, uh, I do have one more, one more off the top of my head was who's this, who's the smartest catcher you were ever around in baseball? Oh, wow. Well, look, I've, I've been blessed to be in 12 All-Star games and then go to the Hall of Fame and talk to Johnny Bench and uh, Carlton Fisk. And, um, I mean, for me, I, I've always enjoyed talk, talking to Johnny Bench because Johnny Bench was a heroic figure and definitely a well-known catcher from the 70s, of course, and into the early 80s. But when you start looking at what he brought to the game, I, I think he kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. And I, 
I know in the baseball world, you know, we still watch the the Carlton Fisk home run and the big red machine. And but if you look at this guy, the way he came up and um, just just uh, you know his interaction with Sparky. I mean, there's another classic manager, you know, Sparky Anderson. Um, and I love that scene when he was telling the young pitcher, he said, "Sit sit ne- sit next to Johnny. Johnny's smart." Like uh, there was that one old time reel. And and I just uh, I love Johnny, man. He was uh, could throw. And I gave him a lot of respect and honor in my speech because, I mean, uh, you can – in baseball, you go, know, who's the greatest? Who's got the greatest stats? Obviously, I got more home runs than, than any catcher. But uh, as far as a catcher, I think that single-handedly redefined the position and brought the position of respect and prominence, which it deserved, to me, would be Johnny Bench. So, um, to me, he's always fun to talk to. He's getting a little older and slowing down a little bit, but it's always – a real pleasure for me to still reconnect with him. Well, hey, good luck to you and Team right. Italy in the Classic. We'll be watching. And thanks for being Please on the show. Please do. Yeah. God bless everyone. Guys, take care and have a great new year, man. Great stuff from Mike Piazza. Fuck yeah, it was. Um, I love that he lives in Italy. He's over there in Italy. You know, his son, he has a nine-year-old son. Uh, doesn't really play ball, but he plays soccer. But it just it makes sense. When you live in Italy, Like that's I guess that's just what... It's what you do. You get definitely get made fun of if you don't play soccer. You get teased if you play baseball in Italy. You get teased. Oh, this yeah. a Puerto American. Oh, mm-hmm. look at a Puerto American play the American sport. You know, and they do that with their hands all the time. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, obviously. I'm very mad I didn't ask Mike Piazza about Mike Piazza's strike zone baseball on N64. I saw it in your notes, and you didn't ask him. Fucked up, man. But it, ha- it happens, though. It happens. Because that was from. my favorite. That was my mm-hmm. favorite baseball. A lot of people were into Ken Griffey Jr. I'm over here hawking Mike Piazza. Look at these. You're hitting. You could hit an 800 foot home run in Mike Piazza strike zone. I don't even think I ever played it. Um, real easy hitting. You didn't have to match up circles with anything. Old school feel. Old school. Yeah. For a traditionalist. A lot of interesting stuff from that. Let's get out. Of, I want to talk there are a couple weird news things that you bring up Scott Stallings in the mm-hmm. post interview. I, a little disrespectful. We didn't say anything about Mike Piazza right away. So apologies to Mike Piazza, but we're not cutting it. We're leaving it. No, up. no. I mean, we, we have all the respect in the world for Mike. Um, he had some huge moments as a player, like just, just insane. Split his time, you know, majority of his time. Uh, started in LA. I wanted to ask him about the nightlife, better nightlife, LA or or New York. But he was he was he was a kid in in LA as at the start of his career. Uh, you think he would have said LA? I don't know when he got married. I don't know when he got married, but I would assume that he was married like while he was in New York. Probably was a a little more a little more chill, reserved, not not hitting the town as much. But. Yeah, it's 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 kind of fifty fifty for me. LA is great, but New York New York nightlife is is hard to beat. Well, I mean, he had a taste right before the strike, post strike, that early mid nineties stretch for baseball, being a celebrity, big time, dude, way bigger than it. I mean, now obviously, you know, you're still big time, but being Mike Piazza with that wet mullet, ninety three, walking around Los Angeles, everybody knew who Mike Piazza was. Ass everybody. looks great in the jeans. Everybody's staring at him. Big body, like you were saying doesn't even need to clear the front side to to go oppo yeah yeah well maybe next time we'll have him on i'm sure he enjoyed the interview he'll come back on with the boys all right this segment is now called carl's favorite clip of the week and i don't know if you saw this but i have to describe it to you so we can use the clip um all right off-season news framber valdez goes home did you see the video of him hitting absolute tanks on the softball field there's nothing i like more than when the latin guys go back to the islands and they just fucking pound softball baseball whatever these videos come out all the time i didn't see it he's got the body uh, um to be a slugger though thick kind of looks like a kegerator Uh, are you chewing something right now um, I was sorry. I took it out of my mouth. Don't be. Sorry. I was picking my teeth. I had steak this morning for breakfast. Did you? Cook I didn't it or? see it. Yeah, I made I made the kids steak and rice for for lunch at school, and then I just had a little bit. Question about fraud: Is our relationship with Cuba fraudulent? I don't know if you saw this. No, the Baseball Federation of Cuba in the United States. Um, 
The United States granted permission for MLB players to play for Cuba in the World Baseball Classic. Players that defected from Cuba. I don't get any of that shit. Who gives a fuck? Why can't they just go play baseball? Am I overstepping my bounds here? I thought that, I thought we were over this Cuba stuff. So players that defected from Cuba can play for – is that what they're, you're saying? They can play for Cuba in the, in the Classic? Why not? I mean, if they have roots, Cuban roots – like, I was asked to play for Puerto Rico, grandfather born there. Like, if you have family and you're, and you're you know, is there a problem? Is there a problem with that? Or no? Are you cheering for Puerto Rico? I would, I would like them to do well. I want to get into the cheering sections, World Baseball Classic, all the different countries. Interact with the different fans. I think the locations are Miami and Scottsdale. That's right. Or Phoenix, I should say. Yeah. Just a couple other things. I want to get Evan Longoria on the show. That's uh, not necessarily a demand. That'd be very nice. I bet he would come on the show with us. He just signed a one-year deal with the Diamondbacks. That's why. Four, I think $4 million. That's a really. Uh, this will be his last year. That's a really nice way to go out. Yeah. 37 years old. Rookie of the year, correct? Um, yeah, <clears throat> all star, great player, champ. Still looks great at thirty seven too. Yeah, high draft picked out of Long Beach State. Love when a college guy gets drafted high, accelerates through the minor league, sticks, lands, and just fucking plays his way through. Like those are great baseball players. Adapt quickly to. He adapted very quickly to pro ball. Great glove, huge arm, huge arm. Yeah. Yeah, and since going out to California, <clears throat> you know, the Giants, I mean, it's just been it's been pretty average for him. But, yeah, I want to say that he dealt – yeah, he dealt with numerous injuries. Uh, he had a shoulder uh, shoulder sprain or something like that. Uh, he had a hand issue. Um, yeah, so 2021 was, wasn't, wasn't a, a year for him where he was able to stay on the field. Uh, he had finger surgery, I believe. Uh, last season so you know an oblique thumb fracture so he's he, he dealt with some injury but you know healthy and it's hard to say you know you stay healthy all year at 37 but when the guy's healthy he can he can help the team out for sure i don't know if you saw two teams gonna be up for sale announced two teams pretty early Which here teams uh, they haven't said who but there's like rumors circulating insiders say i'm i'm gonna guess Orioles and Nationals. I think the Nationals have been up for sale for a while, but they got an issue with the TV deal because they share it with the Orioles. And once that gets figured out, so I, I think both those teams are up for sale. I think they have to be up for sale. And I think the Orioles leadership, whoever owns that team, realizes franchise values are through the roof. They've got a good crop of young players. They take a look around. I'm not spending that money on the rest of the, you know, where baseball is headed. You know, get out now, give it to somebody who can. And they're going to sell the, they could sell the Orioles for $2 billion, I guess. Yeah, <clears throat> you're right. It seems like any major sports franchise now is is two billion plus. Uh, there there has been some interesting stuff. You know, I was obviously with the Orioles for a while, and the relationship between the Nationals and the Orioles, with Masson being owned, like changing hands in ownership between the Orioles or Nationals. I don't know the entire story. I just heard it all, heard bits and pieces of it all the time. Um, like the Lerner family and the Angelos family <clears throat> kind of struggling for control of certain things. Um, I think the Orioles should change ownership. I think it would be, be better for the sport. Um, and I don't, I don't really know. I know, I know that, that Lerner's very old and uh, not doing well, I believe. I don't know the interest level of, of the family to, to stay, stay as owners, but I know that there's billionaires out there that, would love to own, you know, Major League Baseball teams. If I could, I would. Just give me a piece. 0.002%. I'd love to just have a little slice of that. I think Theo is going to be on the Orioles. No, I think he's going to be as part of, like, the ownership group but get involved in the operations. Because when he got out of baseball, I thought Theo said that he wanted to, like, take some time off, and then maybe, like, if he did get back in, it wouldn't be in an ownership capacity. So well, if you're are, somebody with a ton of money and you want to buy a team and you could partner with him, but Theo's like, he'll want equity. 
Of yeah, course. I'm sure I'll put up some money, but then like, hey, I'll work off, you know, the whatever percentage it is. I think an ownership group would, would be willing to let Theo in because it based on what he brings to the table. And how about that? What if, you know, what if Theo went to the Orioles and, and then turned, not only did he turn around Boston and Chicago, but now now Baltimore. That would be that would be pretty legendary. And that's where he that was his first job. He's interning. He was driving to spring break or something, or going to leave to spring break, and the Orioles got back to him. We're like, "Hey, we want to hire you for that internship, but it starts now or something." Or he had to like skip a spring break when he was at Yale. I don't know the whole story. Probably a lot of embellishment with it, but. Um, well, let's talk to Theo soon. All right, here's a little inside baseball. I can tell the story now because he doesn't work for the Cubs anymore. But when he did, he and I agreed. I was going down to Scottsdale. We were going to drive down the side of the road. He was going to be walking on the sidewalk, and I was going to pull up next to him like the bang bus and be like, hey, you look like somebody who's a baseball fan. And he was going to be like, I am. Like, hey, can you answer this question? And I was going to give him, like, money to answer questions and then, like, convince him to come into my – Van, and then I was going to interview him and pretend like and it I fell didn't know apart. Was... What happened with that? Everybody would so, like, love to see that. So the morning of, I email him and I'm like, "Hey, are we cool for today? Or like, what's the timing?" And he was like, "Sorry, last second, man. I got to back out." And he <laughs> cc'd someone from the from the communications team on it. So I went to the Mesa facility and had a lunch meeting in your cafeteria with some people in the communications team. And it was like Theo throwing me a bone for having to cancel it. I'm like, instead of doing mm-hmm. bang bus content with Theo Epstein, I was sitting in your cafeteria with. Yeah, well, he immediately realized it was probably not a right, not a the right thing to do, and said, "Here, I'll just pawn a couple of these people off on you." Meaning Theo Epstein, <laughs> meaning Theo Epstein owes, well, owes us now a bang bus video. Sounds like it. You obviously never forget things like that, so. You know, Theo ain't fucking listening, but if he is, bang bus. How could I forget that? Like, oh, last thing I have, Ron Cook, baseball writer, submits blank ballot to the Hall of Fame for third straight year. Just quickly, I want to sentence this guy what? to prison for 25 years. Who? What's his name? Ron what? Ron Cook. Is this like a protest? What is this? Why is he doing that? He hasn't mentioned anything about it. It's not a protest. He just forgot to fill it out. This is just another chapter in my war against baseball writers. That's a good chapter. What, what, what's he doing? What's going on? Ron? How old is Ron? Ron I don't know shit. 75? I just know Ron fucking... So Ron Cook won't vote for anybody for the Hall of Fame, man. Oh, here you go. Aaron Judge, 16th captain in Yankees history. It's a nice little piece of news. That's our guy. Winks a lot. Yeah, good smile, nice wink. Great face. I mean, it's just obvious. Of course he's your captain. I mean, he was your captain already. It's just, I guess it's now official. So he gets to wear the, uh, well, have the C on the chest or what? I don't, I don't fucking really pay attention to that. But he's your captain whether you announce it or not. So, but it's, it's, it's a big deal, I guess, if you're a Yankees fan. I mean, the guy signed for $360 million. So they give yeah. him a captain. So like, yeah. Yeah. But he, he deserves it. Lead from the front, leaders eat last, lead by example, or you could lead by getting the biggest contract in history, $40 million a year for the next however long. How many homers has Aaron Judge hit this year? Just a real quick prediction. Just We don't have to go too deep into it. Just give me a number. 53. I like 53. I, I was going to say 55. 55. We'll see if they use the juice balls for him again this year. <laughs> Don't. We had a physicist on to talk about those juice balls. But and those they, juice there, b- there were three different balls that they used. There's a Goldilocks ball and these other two fucking balls. He's on record as saying it doesn't matter, though. Me? Well, make me go back. <clears throat> well, he said the differences were so small that it, it, was, uh, it wasn't noticeable. But then why do it? That was my question to him. Like, why do it then? 
materials? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question back. I can't answer that question. Why do it? Because it's... Yeah. They're bored? I don't know. We'll find out. TCU in the national championship game. Oh, man. That's, as soon as we get off here, I got to figure out the ticket situation. I'm going to call Carpenter. I'm going to call some other, some other dudes. Carp said he didn't like his ticket, so he was trying to sit somewhere else. But I just want to be there. I don't care if it's in the top row because we'll just wander around the concourse too, try and make our way onto the field, find a way. Everybody go cheer for the Horn Frogs. I want, an, I want to add a national championship to our show's resume. We got a Cy Young, a World Series, a Silver Slugger, academic All Big Ten. Um, what else? 05 Final Four. I was, I mean, I was in high school, but. Yeah. Some other accolades that, don't, that aren't important, so I'm not even going to list them. You, did, all you di- did enough. All district. All district. You? Me? I'm asking. I, preseason honorable mention. Mm. <laughs> preseason honorable mention. That's an award. Oh, yeah, I don't go. know. There's, there's some other shit in there, but I. Can't remember. Welcome back to Starting Nine. We have a huge week next week and massive news coming for the show. Um, it's good to get back in the swing of things. It's been a while. It's a long break. Good to see you. It was a long break. A lot, a lot happened. We're into the new year now, and um, it's it's going to be a good year. It's going to be a great year. Teams are starting to figure their shit out. We'll find out what happens with Carlos Correa. Frogs national champs. Hopefully, we're, we're able to say that on Tuesday morning. So, thanks for listening, Carl. Appreciate you. Good show, man. As always, as always, brother.